we will begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, send your spirit upon us today as we reflect on today's gospel from John chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Jesus said to Nicodemus, no one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. As we hear the presentations tonight, Lord, please help us to always remember that God sent his son to save us and all that we do to lead in the church today, we do to help others to come to meet Jesus Christ and be saved as well. We ask all of this in your name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So tonight there will be two presentations. Um, the first will be from Chris Herdebees. He'll be talking, giving a presentation about personal growth as a catechist. And then I will be doing the second presentation on the new directory for catechesis. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and he can introduce himself and his presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, as Peggy mentioned, my name is Chris Herdebees and as you can see on the little tile on your GoToMeeting program. You can see my name there as well. You're probably wondering how that bizarre name is pronounced, but it's pronounced Herdebees. And <clears throat> I work together here out of the Bishop Hammes Center with Peggy in Hagen, Wisconsin, just north of Rice Lake, um, if you're familiar with that part of the diocese. Uh, my title for the diocese is the Director of Evangelization and Missionary Discipleship. And uh, that's a new office that Bishop Powers created uh, just this uh, just this year in March, um, after about a year of conversations with myself and Peggy and several other leaders at the Chancery, um, we decided that it was it was time to have a dedicated office um, driving uh, the initiative of evangelization and missionary discipleship in our diocese. So he created that office and asked uh, me, tasked me with running that. Um, so I'm really excited to have that new role. Uh, previous to that, I worked as Peggy's associate and as the associate director of uh, Catholic Formation for the diocese. So it's a great pleasure to be with you all tonight. So my title or the title of my talk for tonight is The Dust of the Master. And I'll let you know what that means uh, a little bit later on in my presentation. I'll probably talk for about a half of an hour or so. Um, and then at the end, if you have any questions, um, feel free. We'll have a quick Q&A time at the end of my talk. If you have any questions during the talk as well, I'm going to do my best to ignore the chat function while I'm speaking, but you can put them in there and, and I'll get to those at the end. Uh, but the title of my remarks tonight is The Dust of the Master. And like I said, I'll explain that a little bit later on, but the subtitle is really the crux of it. And it's catechizing from our own encounter and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. So teaching uh, doing our, our role as religious educators, um, whether that's on Wednesday night or su Sunday morning or whenever catechesis happens at your parishes, um, doing that task, that very important task of imparting the faith uh, to young people or to adults, if that's um, what you're doing at your parishes, from the place of our own encounter and relationship with Jesus and with the church. Um, the new de director of catechesis, which Peggy will be talking about uh, at length later on in her presentation, this is kind of the heart of the new director of catechesis. Uh, this idea, which is not new, <laughs> but this idea that to effectively catechize, to effectively pass on the faith and teaching to anyone, um, young people, uh, young adults, adults, older people, um, to do that effectively, it has to be an echo, a reflection, that's literally what the word catechesis means, of our own lived relationship with Jesus and the church of our own encounter with Jesus, um, whether that's in the sacraments and prayer. Um, and we'll get into a lot of that throughout the course of the night. 
I'm gonna go ahead and get rolling here. Uh, my, one of my favorite quotes, uh, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard me use this quote before, is the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And for us uh, in the realm of catechesis, the main thing um, is, is spelled out very clearly for us. The definitive aim of catechesis, the definite purpose or goal of catechesis is to put people not only in touch, but in communion and in intimacy with Jesus Christ. And again, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And so we can go down all sorts of um, paths of distraction and, and pursuing other goals at times, but the main thing, which we can never lose sight of, the definitive aim of our, our job as catechists is to put people not only in touch, not only to tell people about Jesus and get them vaguely in touch with Jesus, but in communion, in intimacy with Jesus Christ. That's a, a quote from Pope St. John Paul II. And then this beautiful quote from uh, Pope Francis, just to, to further get us going. On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. And what is that proclamation? That Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, to strengthen, and to free you. Nothing is more solid, more profound, more secure, more meaningful, and more wisdom-filled than that initial proclamation, says Pope Francis. Um, whatever we're tasked with teaching this year as catechists, whether that's the sacraments or the liturgy or prayer or um, the Old Testament or the New Testament or some the, the moral life of, of, of being a, a disciple of Jesus, uh, whatever our task is in catechesis this year, the first proclamation must ring out over and over and over again, namely that Jesus Christ loves the people we're trying to, to serve. We need to constantly be saying that. We need to constantly be saying, he gave his life to save you. <laughs> and constantly be saying, and now he's still here in his Holy Spirit. He's living at your side every day. And he wants to enlighten your minds. He wants to strengthen your wills. He wants to free you from sin. And there's nothing um, more important that, than we can do than to, to continually proclaim that, whatever our, our topic is. Um, but the, the first talk tonight that I'm kind of stealing Peggy's thunder with all of this <laughs> is going to focus on the fact that if we're going to do that, we have to constantly be experiencing that ourselves. We've been using this uh, chart for a number of years as we've been forming the religious ed directors and coordinators and youth ministers um, at the parish level. We've been using this chart over and over again. And a lot of you have probably seen this before. Um, this is the, the process of, of helping people to come to know and enter into relationship with Christ in the church, um, catechizing them, mentoring them, discipling them, and then sending them out on mission and catechesis takes part to, is the third part of this of this process, and um, it's becoming more and more urgent that we get the chronology of forming uh, disciples of Jesus correct. Um, the more secular our culture gets, the the more young people fall away from the church. We can in no way take for granted that young people have encountered Jesus before or that older people have encountered Jesus before, that they know who Jesus is and what he has done for them. We can no way um, take for granted that uh, they have relationships with, with dedicated disciples of Jesus. That's, that's step one is pre-evangelization, building relationships, creating a sense of belonging and welcome. Um, step two, though, is, is this initial proclamation that Pope Francis so beautifully just talked about in that quote. Proclaiming the kerygma. Kerygma is a, a fancy Greek word that just means the, the kernel of the absolute boiled down simplest explanation, uh, exposition of, of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. We can't take that for granted. And so let's go back to that quote again. On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over again that Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And he's now living at your side each and every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. That's evangelization. And Peggy's going to do a, a beautiful job in our second talk, talking about the relationship between evangelization and catechesis. 
But what's at stake in all of this? Um, why, why is it so important that we get this right? Um, the, uh, as we are developing the idea of the new Office of Evangelization and Missionary Discipleship, uh, we did the gut-wrenching work of pulling out the statistics of sacraments of initiation um, and uh, the sacrament of marriage in our diocese over the last uh, 20, 20, 30 years or so. And this, this chart that I've got in front of you now is, is a little bit gut-wrenching. What's at stake? <laughs> Um, as our, our culture has moved from, from one of being kind of a Christendom culture of uh, safely being able to take for granted that most everybody's a Christian and they're probably going to stay Christian, at least to some extent, uh, that has just eroded year after year after year and quicker and quicker um, year after year. And, and so what you're looking at in front of you now is our, our chart for the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and marriage as a diocese since 1993. And you can see it's just a very steady, consistent decline in those numbers. And numbers aren't everything, but there's no way that we can spin these numbers and get a sense that everything is okay. <laughs> Um, we know. Um, look at your own family. I know I can look at my own family, and, and there are many people in my family uh, who ha are not baptizing their children, who are not, who maybe were baptized and are not getting confirmed, who maybe were confirmed but are not getting married in the church now. And uh, this hits really close to home for a lot of us. These sacramental trends um, are indicative of the fact that the church is losing its influence. And what does it mean that the church is losing its influence? It doesn't just mean that, uh, well, people aren't as Catholic as they used to be. Let's just call a spade a spade. Lives, eternal lives are at stake, right? This is this is a big, big deal. <laughs> and the popes, God bless them, uh, since Paul the sixth in the in the early seventies, but especially with John Paul II, have called, seen these numbers, experienced this reality, and called for a new evangelization. John Paul II famously said, the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization. And why did he call for that? I think he saw these numbers and he realized where a lot of these people who are not baptizing their children, aren't sticking around for confirmation, aren't getting married in the church, were catechized. They went to religious ed, they went to Catholic schools, and yet they fell away from the faith. What what gives? And John Paul II says, we need to commit all of our energies to a new evangelization, to proclaiming who Jesus Christ is, to inviting people into a relationship with him, and then discipling them. And, and again, Peggy's going to unpack a lot of this for us uh, in her talks. But this image on the right-hand uh, side of your screen right now is an image of the lifeboats from the Titanic. And this is an image that we got from a, a beautiful book called Divine Renovation by Father James Mallon. Um, and we read this book uh, about two years ago now, a year and a half ago now, and it's just really inspired a lot of our vision for evangelization and evangelization and catechesis and just where we need to move as a church. And um, Father James does a beautiful job of kind of encapsulating and, and boiling down a lot of the thought of the popes from the last 50, 60 years. Um, in a beautiful way, but he uses this image of the lifeboats from the Titanic, and I'll just briefly uh, explain where he's coming from with that. So all of us know the story of the Titanic, right? That as the biggest sh ship that ever sailed is uh, dubbed the unsinkable ship. Um, tragically, that was uh, very far from the truth on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic from uh, the UK over to New York. It's an iceberg and crashes. Uh, there were just over 2,000 people on board the Titanic. Um, and there were only lifeboats enough for about half of them. It's now illegal to not have lifeboats enough for all the passengers on a ship, but um, at that point it was not, and uh, they thought the ship was unsinkable, so they didn't bother uh, getting enough lifeboats for everyone. But uh, of the 20 lifeboats that there were, two got stuck when they were trying to launch them and, and weren't able to be launched, and the 18 that were launched were only about half full in their uh, zeal um, to get people out of the ship and, and down to safety, they didn't even fill the ships up. When the ships did reach the water, uh, they nece uh, necessarily had to remove themselves away from the Titanic, uh, lest they be sucked down when the ship actually sank down 
uh, to the bottom of the ocean. But the tragic thing, um, there are many tragic things about this story, but one of the really tragic things is that um, only two of the 18 lifeboats that were successfully launched actually went back to look for survivors. And those two went back so late that they only found nine people. And of those nine, um, three eventually died of hypothermia. And Father Malin uses this image, I think, in a very provocative <laughs> Uh, but very helpful way to show us that the church exists for the salvation of souls. And all of her mission, which is given to us by Jesus Christ at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel and the Great Commission, is to evangelize, to make disciples of all nations. And friends, our culture is, is crying out in brokenness and woundedness in so many, so many tragic ways. Our suicide rate is as high as it's ever been. Our fertility rate is as low as it's ever been. And those are two very indicative markers of the health of a society's soul. Our culture is crying out in um, agony. And we as, as Catholic Christians believe that the gospel is the answer to all of life's greatest questions. And, and so our mission is to go out and make disciples. The moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization. And your role as catechists, I'm a catechist as well, all, all of our roles as catechists is, in, is a vital, vital role within that, um, within that calling. Sounds a little daunting though, right? <laughs> There's a, a quote that I find uh, a lot of solace in, and it's that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Some of you have probably heard that quote before. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And I was looking for um, the author of that quote and there was, I didn't get any clear answer as to who it was. And in, in looking for uh, the author, I found an article about that quote um, that said, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, well, sort of. And uh, like I said, I, I take a lot of solace in that. I don't particularly feel like God equipped me to do the job that I have, but he does day by day equip me to do the job that he called me to do. And if you've been a catechist before, you know that this is so true, right? It's not like you had your PhD in, in biblical studies and then your DRE came along and said, oh, you're perfectly equipped to teach this seventh grade Old Testament class, <laughs> right? No, instead, God called you out of the comfort of your Wednesday nights, whatever you would have been doing, and said, I'll give you all that you need to do this role um, because I'm calling you to do this. But there, the article made this beautiful point that if we look at the people that God calls in scripture, it's not that they're utterly unequipped to do the task that God sets them out for, right? Think of David. Um, David in the Old Testament, right? We think he's just this little shepherd boy and that uh, he beats Goliath by purely by the grace of God, right? But if you look back a few chapters earlier, we know about David that he had been practicing his strength. <laughs> like the, the, the amazing one in a million slingshot that he takes uh, that kills Goliath is a, is a, a, a thing that he had done thousands and thousands of times. He had killed a bear. He had killed a lion. He had been doing the work to prepare himself for the task that God would eventually call him to. A more uh, practical example is the, the two photos on the right side of your screen. Of course, we all know uh, Pope St. John Paul II, who's one of my great heroes. Some of you have heard me talk before about the other fellow on this screen. His name is Jan Tiranowski. And Jan Tiernowski was a, a bachelor, was a tailor uh, in Krakow in Poland when John Paul II was a young man. And when John Paul II and some of the other young men uh, went to the priest and, and said, we want to we want to grow in our faith. We want to learn how to follow the Lord in these insanely trying times. Right. The, the Nazis were um, uh, in charge of Poland. They had attacked and, and conquered the country. The Russians. <laughs> Uh, where the Soviets were were beating on the door on the on the eastern um, border of Poland, and there's all these young disciples of the Lord that were just desperately longing for direction and mentorship, and so Jan Chernowski's priest came to him and said, "Jan, I know you. You are a man of God. Um, I know you have no 
training in being a catechist. You have no training. Uh, you've not been in any way equipped to mentor young men in living a life of discipleship. But you've been being equipped for this for decades, you know, coming to mass, praying the rosary every day, reading the lives of the saints. These are things that Jan did on a daily basis. And he was growing in intimacy and love for Jesus Christ through through frequenting the sacraments and giving his heart and his mind to the Lord. And so it's it's true that God doesn't call the equipped, that he equips the called. But we also are charged as baptized members of the church to be covered in the dust of the master. This is a, a saying that uh, Fellowship of Catholic University students focus, if you've heard of that apostolate before, they do amazing work of um, campus ministry at, at hundreds of, well, dozens, I don't know how many, but many, many college campuses all around the country. And Bishop Barron and Father Mike Schmitz and many other uh, leaders in the church are have frequently said that Focus is doing probably the best um, discipleship work of any group in the Catholic Church in the country. But they love this saying, may the dust of the master or the dust of the rabbi be upon you. And what they mean by that is, may you be following so close after Jesus that his dust is in your nostrils, <laughs> that it's covering your clothes, that it's all over your face. That's the, that's the model that Jesus gave to us follow me, right? We had this this um, very, very uh, provocative gospel reading recently at Mass, right, of get behind me, Satan, when uh, Peter rebukes Jesus for saying that he's going to die. Peter, or Jesus turns around and rebukes him and says, get behind me. He's not saying get lost, Peter. He's saying get behind me. Your job is to follow me. And that's all of our jobs, friends, as, as baptized members of the body of Christ, is to follow Jesus in a life of discipleship. And friends, when we do that, when we when we give our lives to Jesus day after day after day through prayer, through frequenting the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and reconciliation, when we're in scripture, uh, when we're seeking after holy friendships, people that we know are going to lead us to Christ and to the holiness that he's calling us to, when we do that, we may not have technical uh, skills and abilities that have equipped us to be catechists or to do some other leadership role in the church. But when God does call us to those sorts of things, and he's calling you this year again, praise God, to be catechists, um, we are equipped to follow where he's leading. And so I wanted to to conclude my time with you guys tonight in just talking through this tool. And we emailed this out to you this afternoon. So if you didn't get this yet, my apologies, but it's on your screen. Uh, it should be in your, at least in your DRE's email inbox, if it's not in your email inbox right now, but I'd encourage you to print it off. It's a two-page flyer, and some of you have seen it before. I've updated it a, a number of times over the last year or two, uh, but it's a, a document that I call Evangelizing Disciples, and uh, I used to call it, you can't spell discipler without the, the, the word disciple, but that's very clumsy, so <laughs> I call it Evangelizing Disciples now, um, and if you go back several slides to this chart, what it's acknowledging is that the, the process of uh, being formed as a disciple of Jesus, that's not the end. This is a loop. It's a cycle. And it is supposed to keep replicating itself over and over and over and over again, where um, we're, we're building relationships through pre-evangelization. And then we're sharing the good news of who Jesus Christ is. We're helping people to encounter him, uh, especially in the Eucharist. We're discipling them through rich catechesis and mentorship, and then we're sending them out as missionaries to make more disciples. And it continues on and on and on and on and on. And friends, this is how the early church just exploded. Think of this. The early church went from almost nothing to a century or two later, there being thousands of Christians all over the Roman Empire. And this is the model uh, that Jesus gave to us. But how do we go about doing this? How do we go about doing this? Well, I wanted to just start uh, the how section with, with this very inspiring quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is number 905, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says this. It says, lay people also fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelization. That is the proclamation of Christ by word and the testimony of our life, not just by the way we live, but by word as well. 
For lay people, this evangelization acquires a specific property and a peculiar efficacy because it is accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. And I just want to focus in on two of those words, a peculiar efficacy. Those are big, big words, right? What does what is the catechism saying? The catechism is saying it is that it's vitally important for us as lay people. I can't see your screens anymore. I don't know if any priests or deacons are with us tonight, but it's it's peculiarly effective. It's it's uniquely powerful for us as lay people to be evangelizing, to sharing the good news of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done in our own lives. And why is that? Because it's accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. We've got 22 people on the line tonight, and some of you are in groups. So let's say we've got 15 parishes represented tonight. Just think about your own parish for just a minute. Within uh, the membership of your parish, you have people from probably every industry in your town or towns, right? Farmers, doctors, mechanics, lawyers, uh, you name it. You probably also have people from every socioeconomic class in your town, from really, really wealthy people to middle class people to very, really poor people and everywhere in between. You also probably have some pretty liberal people and some pretty conservative people from every political end of the spectrum in your town. Every way that you can classify people, there's probably someone in your parish who has a membership in that sphere of influence in your town. And so the catechism says the um, evangelization of the laity is vital for the mission of the church because it happens in the ordinary circumstances of the world. Whoever that mechanic is in your parish, your priest probably doesn't have a relationship with the other mechanics at that shop. Whoever the farmer is in your parish, and there's a bunch of them in our diocese, um, your priest may not have a relationship with the people at the feed store or the other farmers that they're in relationship with. Whoever the doctors are, the teachers, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. It's peculiarly effective. It's uniquely powerful for us to carry out the mission of evangelization. But how do we do that? How do we actually go about doing that? You're going to do that in a unique way in your classrooms or whatever format catechesis takes in your parishes. But I want to just challenge us in that if that's the only place that we're seeking to evangelize and to carry out the church's mission, then there's some inauthenticity taking place there. There's some, it's not going to come across as authentic to the young people. The church makes some bold claims. The church claims that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And young people in our increasingly secular world um, are increasingly skeptical of that bold claim that Jesus is not a way and a truth, and a way of life, but the way, the truth, and the life. And if um, Wednesday night or Sunday morning or the events that I run or the, the things that we do in our different roles of leading in the church, if that's the only time that we're seeking to evangelize, um, I think that there's some inauthenticity taking place there, but it's scary, right? We're not called evangelicals for a reason. There's a reason evangelicals are called evangelicals, and it's because they're very bold and they're very good at doing this. Uh, but we can learn a lot from them. So I'm going to run us through uh, this discipleship checkup and then briefly go through an evangelization checklist. So the first part is our discipleship checkup. And this is just a, a list of questions that I decided I want to ask myself on a regular basis to see if I am, um, it's kind of like if, if you went to the, the doctor for a, a yearly checkup, um, there'd be a handful of questions that he'd ask just to to he or she would ask just to make sure that you're living a healthy lifestyle, right? These are a handful of questions that I thought I need to ask myself to just see if I'm I'm authentically uh, in a, a healthy place as a disciple of Jesus. So again, these are on the handout. Um, I just uh, took the images from the handout and put them up here. So this is the exact same thing that'll be in your email inbox, or maybe it's in your hand right now. Uh, but what are those questions? What has God been saying in your daily prayer recently? What has God been saying in your daily prayer recently? That, of course, implies that we are at least trying to pray every day, right? Uh, but praying in such a way that we're not just muscling through a, a handful of rote prayers, but we're trying to actually communicate with the Lord. What has God been saying in your daily prayer recently? How has the Lord fed you in the sacraments lately, especially in the Eucharist and reconciliation? 
all of us obviously have an obligation to go to mass uh, on a weekly basis. We also have an obligation to go to confession at least once a year. But we're also called to make use of those sacraments to grow in relationship with the Lord, uh, to allow him to form us as his disciples. May we be covered in the dust of the master, right? Maybe we'd be drawing so close to Jesus in those sacraments. How has the Lord fed us and led us in those sacraments lately? How has God led you in the past year? What's a, a concrete example? Maybe God led you in some really big and dramatic way. Uh, maybe he, he, he led you to, to quit a job and, and to move in a different direction career-wise. Um, maybe he led you to, to move or to be open to having a, another child or uh, some other dramatic big way. Maybe it was he, God led you in, in a, a small way in, in the past year that you can think of. Maybe it's the fact that you said yes to becoming a catechist. Maybe that was really uh, something that you experienced uh, confirmation in your prayer. What is standing out in your spiritual reading and your time in the word lately? If the Lord's going to be forming us, uh, he's going to need a, a means to do that. And scripture being in, in the readings of mass every day or working our way through the gospels is a really powerful, beautiful way to do that. What are some areas of brokenness in your life that you have invited God into recently or in the past? How did he work to bring reconciliation, healing, or new life? If you go back to that quote from Pope Francis, I'll stay on the screen, but Pope Francis says, On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. What are some areas of brokenness in your life that you've invited God into recently? Um, if we're going to proclaim that good news to the young people in our classrooms, we have to experience that first, right? We want to proclaim that Jesus is living at their side to enlighten, strengthen, and free them. But are, are we experiencing that he's by our side, seeking to enlighten us, to strengthen us, and free us? And, and can we bear witness and testimony to how he's done that? And then lastly, what is one way that you've seen God come through for you or another Christian in the past month? What's, what's one concrete way that you've seen prayer be answered? These are beautiful things for us to just sit with and, and, and reflect on um, because it strengthens our faith when we do this, when we allow ourselves to see that God is at work, that he's moving, that he's alive, that he has a heart to continue the work of redemption in individual lives today, just as much as he did uh, 2,000 years ago when he was walking around the Holy Land. Um, that increases our faith, uh, but it also is going to equip us to be uh, very effective catechists. All right, and then evangelization checklist. Like I said, uh, if we're going to be evangelists uh, for an hour a week, uh, it's kind of incumbent upon us to, to be evangelists all the time. What are some really simple ways that we can start to do this? Again, for us as Catholics, this is kind of a new concept. Um, so I've, these are uh, just some tips that I've gleaned from people who are much better at this and more experienced and open to this than I am. So first of all, pray for openness to be a witness. This is a great, simple little prayer to pray first thing every day before you leave your house. Or uh, I'd like to say if you have a family before you get out of bed, because <laughs> we can be a witness to our family uh, from, from the very get-go every morning. So th pray this prayer for openness. Holy Spirit, I am available today. Use me as you will. And I can speak from firsthand experience that God will answer that prayer. <laughs> I am a, a fairly shy introvert, um, and I don't enjoy talking to strangers. Uh, but it, praying this prayer, God has definitely uh, caught my attention and invited me to do that. And that's not, you know, grabbing somebody in the Walmart parking lot and uh, opening up the Bible necessarily. It could just be uh, talking to, to a coworker, talking to a family member and, and just sharing um, the fact that God loves them. Right. That, that quote from Pope Francis, again, Jesus Christ loves you. Like, I know you're going through a hard time. I want to be with you and support you in that hard time. But God loves you. He gave his life to save you, to prove that and to show that, to accomplish that love. Um, Holy Spirit, I'm available today. Use me as you will. The second thing is to listen attentively to people that you interact with. Uh, if the Holy Spirit is going to prompt us to be a witness, 
Um, we also have to be listening to the people that we're talking to. It's so easy and we all fall into this, right? The busier we are, the easier it is to, to uh, be standing there looking at somebody as they're talking and be thinking about the next thing that you need to do or the next thing that you're going to say. But if we're, if we're going to share the love of God with people, we have to receive who they are, receive their hearts, listen attentively. The third thing then is um, as we're listening, as we're um, telling the Holy Spirit that we're available, um, as people share difficult things with us, their needs, their hurts, their losses, their desires, um, we can offer to pray for those things. Um, and the next level way to do that is to offer to pray with them right then and there. Can I pray with you about that right now? Um, realize maybe this is kind of awkward, but just feel like God is calling me to, to offer to do that. And um, either way, if you just tell people that you're going to be praying for whatever the, the thing that they shared with you, or if you do it right there with them, it's really important to follow up um, maybe a week later, or, or even if it's a, a really desperate situation, follow up a day or two later and just ask how it's going. And that does two things. It really builds relationships um, in, a, in a very powerful way. It shows that you actually did pray for them or continue to pray for them. Um, but it also builds this trust and this relationship that, that leads to um, people being more open to, to becoming a, a more serious Christian themselves. It, it builds people's faith uh, in the gospel to see that we really are practicing what we're preaching. Another thing that we can do to evangelize is to share vulnerably about a way that the Lord has worked in our life in a similar situation. Um, start with, I know in my own life, um, say somebody's uh, parents are, are going through a divorce. Um, my, my dad's parents got divorced and um, my, I grew up with uh, three sets of grandparents and, and it made for a lot of uh, friction and, and difficulty in our family at times. Um, I know in my own life, when, when that happened in my family, it was, it was really difficult. Um, but this is a way that, that, that God really came through and, and helped me and my family to grow through that experience, whatever that might be. Uh, the work that we do in our discipleship and as evidence in that discipleship checkup can bear tons of fruit in our evangelization efforts. And the last is to invite people to go deeper with you in some meaningful way. Bring them to adoration, bring them to mass, bring them to confession, bring them to a, invite them to a, a follow, follow up conversation over coffee or lunch or something. Um, go golfing with them, <laughs> go hunting with them, go shopping with them, do something with them. Um, the, the really important thing here is, is when we invite people to go deeper, it's to invite them to go deeper with us. Um, if, if you invite somebody to go to adoration and say, hey, it would be a really, really good thing i think if you went to this holy hour that's coming up why don't you go do that or you should bring that bring that um that sin that you shared with me to confession that would be a really good thing to do like that's a, that's fine and that's good to invite people to do that but it's it's way more powerful and it's way more likely that they will actually do that if you invite them to come along with you and that touches on the last point and the last point is that um, all of us are called to a life of discipleship with Jesus. We're all called to be disciples of the Lord. But we all need people in our own lives to be discipling us as well. That's true for every human being on the planet. Pope Francis, <laughs> Bishop Jim, everybody, every member of the body of Christ needs people in their own lives uh, to be supporting them. People who have permission to call them on to greatness. People who have permission to to call them out when they're doing something that's not helpful, right? We all need people uh, to walk with us. And, and my hope is that you have that with uh, your DRE or your CRE or your youth minister, whoever is leading you at your parish. Um, but this, this tool that I've put in your hands or at least put on your screens for tonight is a really helpful tool for doing that together. So uh, if you've got uh, a handful of people that you get together with at church, uh, for coffee or breakfast on a, a fairly regular basis, if you're part of a Bible study or something, if you're going to get together this year as catechists, uh, this tool would be a really helpful tool for entering into that together. If we're going to uh, live out this beautiful quote from Pope Francis, which I'll just pull up as we close, if we're going to live this out, that on the lips of the catechists, the first proclamation must ring out over and over again. 
Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. If we're going to live that out, um, we need people in our lives to walk that journey with us. So thank you so much for your attention tonight. Thank you so much for giving up an evening uh, to be formed in what it means to be a catechist here in the Diocese of Superior. Um, but thank you for your yes, your yes to being a catechist and um, your yes to, to being vulnerable and, and, and doing a, a difficult job that's so important, uh, that's more important now than ever. I'm going to close this in a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, we thank you, and God, we praise you for being such a good, good father to us. A father who loves his children and knows his children, um, who invites his children um, into the work that he is about, the work of redemption, the work of um, bringing each and every human heart and soul into relationship with yourself. We dedicate our work of catechesis this year to you. We entrust it to you. And we entrust it to you, um, especially through the intercession of Mary, as we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. on my clock. So I am going to get started um, with my part of the presentation. Um, my part of the presentation is um, about the Directory for Catechesis. This document was published by the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization in Rome. And it is amazing how um, if you know, if you've been a catechist for a while and you know about the Directory of Catechesis and the National Directory of Catechesis, kind of our, our marching orders, you know, what are we supposed to do as catechesis? Why do we do it? What are we supposed to do? And this new document came out um, um, just this last summer, and it really focuses on evangelization and, and what Christopher's been talking about and what we've been talking about for the last few years um, from the diocesan level of how catechesis should intertwine with evangelization. So um, this is, the, um, that is what I'll be covering in the um, the highlights, basically, of this document in my presentation tonight. So, over and over, you may have heard that as baptized members of the church, we are called by Jesus when he gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So what does this mean? As Chris explained in his talk, Jesus has asked us to share him, Jesus, with other people. So sometimes as members of the church, we want to keep Jesus to ourselves. But unfortunately, that's not what we're called to do. As catechists, as teachers of faith, we take on even more of a role in this great commission. We not only have to have a personal relationship with Christ, so he's the center of our own life, but we need to share that love of Christ with those we are called to teach. So let's take a look at this in another parable. Mark tells us that Jesus went up the mountain and called to him those who he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. So when we all know that when Jesus goes up on the mountain, something important is going to happen. And what has he done this time? He has called people. He then surrounds himself with those he wants. Jesus surrounds himself with us. So he has chosen us. He has called us to spread the word. He appointed 12 to lead, just as the church today has appointed people to lead. Jesus appointed people to lead as well. 
And he sent them out to preach and teach, just as by our baptism, we are called to preach and teach. I would like to get into what the directory of catechesis tells us by first explaining what the word catechesis means. We typically hear faith formation for young people called religious education, faith formation, or even CCD. However, those terms are very limited in what catechesis really is. Catechesis is Greek and means to echo the gospel. It is an ecclesial or church act. It arises from the missionary mandate of Jesus that we just referenced from Matthew 28. It is aimed at making the proclamation of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection continually resound or be heard and felt over and over in the heart of every person so that an individual's life may be transformed. Catechesis should change the lives of those participating. Knowing this, it helps us to understand how intertwined catechesis is with evangelization. The directory for catechesis explains that evangel evangelization is not the delivery of a doctrine, but rather makes present the and announces Jesus Christ. Evangelization is making the enduring presence of Christ concrete or real in such a way that those who draw near to the church, who wanna be part of the church may encounter him, may feel his presence in their lives so that their lives may be saved. So in turn, they will see the world in a new way and prepare for eternal life. Pope Paul VI explained in Evangelii Nuntiandi, there is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. Catechesis should strive to embody this. Catechesis should seek to embrace the both and of faith. It should recognize and deliver faith as a content to be learned and believed, but it should also present the faith as a unique response to God. Catechesis cannot be divorced from evangelization because God calls the evangelists and us as catechists to accompany people on their journey of faith, to be a merciful witness of God's love and to share in the fruit of communion. We should be sharing our life, our faith, our witness in community, in communion, in partnership with others. So, So what is the purpose of catechesis? It is to proclaim the why, which is Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is also the who. So we often tell people the what of the faith, you know, what is this about our faith? What is it that we believe? What is it that we do? But we lack the why we believe it. And we lack the who. The how is the practical carrying out. Does every child, every adult, every person we deem to catechize walk away knowing why and who we are studying? So are you inviting those you catechize to make a decision to follow Jesus? Uh, a few years ago, Bishop Barron preached in a homily about people learning to speak by what they hear. And in that gospel parable about the dumb mute, the mute couldn't speak speak because he couldn't verbalize what others were saying. So if we never heard God's word, how can we speak of it? If we never speak God's word to those we catechize, they are never going to be able to follow Jesus. So just as Chris showed us that map of the decline, somewhere along the line, we've, first, we've forgotten to share God's word to answer the why, the who, in which we're learning about. So if the gospel message, the who, is going to remain relevant to people today, you as a catechist must look for ways to connect it with real life experiences, the how, and help others to do the same. As a catechist, you must proclaim the message of Christ's love using where, wherever you can possible, the elements of culture, the world around us, our personal experiences. We need to relate faith and what we believe to what is happening in the real lives of the people we are catechizing. 
you know, faith is not like an academic subject where the student can begin with little to no understanding or experience and over time become proficient. Faith is not something learned or accomplished through one's efforts. It's a gift given by the Holy Spirit, which must be freely received. So one must be open to divine revelation before one can begin to understand it or conform to its demand. We cannot expect somebody to embrace wholeheartedly the faith if we don't bring them to understand the who and the why in which faith is important in their lives. <clears throat> Both evangelization and catechesis communicate divine revelation through scripture and tradition. So both of them aim to facilitate this deeper religious conversion and ultimately put communion, put people in communion with Christ or, and the church. So think of it as a missionary catechesis. Um, it, it not only needs to relate church doctrine to the current problems and issues of, of, the, of each individual, but it also needs to communicate the, the faith effectively. So all the teaching, all witness, all formation and education in the faith has as its goal assisting others so that they can enter more and more deeply into the life of Christ or who or the why in which we believe. So let's talk about the how. Pope St. John Paul II stated, when catechesis is done well, everything else is easier to do. So catechesis, we'll say, has five components. It has the component of accompaniment, which is walking with those who are called, who we are called to catechize. It is personal and it is extended over a period of time. You need to have your own personal faith, but you need to be able to share that personal journey, your own personal journey with someone else so that they can also have a personal journey. It educates, catechesis educates when we provide others with that understanding of Christ. So, you know, referring to particular scripture and tradition and doctrine that relates to everyday life, that's education. Formation is when we assist in building that person up in faith, helping them to believe in Jesus Christ. And illumination is when we help a person understand themselves and the whole human history. Um, this can be accomplished when we help people to understand God's role in our lives. So if we can understand God in our own personal lives, share how to others what that means for us, how they then can maybe see God in their own personal lives. And celebration is our, our introduction of that celebration of the mystery of God, that beauty and awe and wonder of God. And it points to the sacraments and especially the mass. Where is Christ and that wonderful celebration of the Eucharist? So what's our aim of catechesis? It is, as Pope St. John Paul II said in Catechesis in Our Time, is to put people into intimate communion with Christ. Communion with Christ is the center of the Christian life and as a result, the center of the catechetical action. So our goal then for catechesis is to help transform each person to make Christ the center of their life. Catechesis forms believers for mission, um, accompanying them in the, to be mature in their attitudes of faith, making sure that they are missionary, that they can go out and live their faith. Um, we are called to a particular activity in proclaiming the gospel and making the kingdom present in the world. We can do all of these things through kind of an apprenticeship approach. So if you think of catechesis as apprenticing someone to on the journey of faith, let's say, so we teach them, we reveal the content of faith. You know, what does faith mean? We can't grow in faith without learning those contents of faith. But we also need to show them, you know, what is being taught. Can they see Christ, what we are saying about Jesus Christ and the church? Can we see it in our lives and the benefits of it? And can we try it? Can we actually go out and practice it? And then then we automatically start to do. So what is repeatedly tried, what we are accountable for, what we continually do over and over again becomes a habit. So we wanna teach, we wanna show, we wanna try, and we wanna do. So are we empowering those we teach to live the Christian life independently?
So as Chris described in the process of evangelization, it is clear we can no longer see catechesis as the step um, in time between pre-evangelization and ongoing formation. It must be more fluid than that. Catechesis should no longer be looked at as this book ended part where we start with pre-evangelization, we evangelize, we catechize, and then we have ongoing formation. It's much more fluid than that. It's a fluid process through each of the stages of evangelization. We have to grow in knowledge as we continually move along our stages of evangelization. It's a building block for every stage of life. So catechesis is kind of, in, in some ways, a center of evangelization. So the great work of providing the foundational blocks of the Christian life, it provides that inner internalization of the faith and an integration of the faith in life. So, as I said, it's a foundation. It's that base knowledge to hold up that house. Okay, what, what holds up the house? Knowledge, that foundation, catechesis. But it's also an internalization, getting to the heart of the person. It's one thing to have head knowledge of faith, but without your heart, without the heart knowledge of faith, it's hard to carry it on. And it needs to then, having that head and heart knowledge, we can integrate it into life. It can be a lived reality. So ultimately, to live the life God has called us to, we need to see everything in a new way. So our tasks as catechists flow straight from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. The Holy Spirit descends on the apostles, which shows us that we are tasked with leading others to knowledge in the faith. The gospel is proclaimed, and we as catechists are initiating others into the celebration of the mystery of faith. Conversion occurs. The people are cut to the heart. We should also be exposing Christ to the hearts of others by helping individuals form their life to Christ. Finally, in Acts of the Apostles, catechesis finally occurs because their hearts are opened. We do this in the best way when we teach others how to pray. Teaching others how to pray and really forming that life of prayer helps us to understand and accept that heart knowledge of catechesis. The apostles finally are in communion and sent on mission. So we are too, as teachers, are, formed, are here to help form community and profess the faith and celebrate the faith and live in community. And the picture shown here on this slide is a perfect portrayal and beauty of, of, of community in this painting of the Trinity. If you look at this painting, the Trinity is a rounded table with food on it. And, they've, you, and we have been invited into this meal, this divine meal, not because we earned it, but because of God's merciful love for us. God's mercy makes room for us. God invites us. God loves us. Whether or not our learners hear and respond to a truth of the faith is not solely dependent on whether we use the right method to teach it. It is not all up to us. It is the Holy Spirit that is the true teacher. The fire of the Holy Spirit is given in the form of tongues in Acts of the Apostles and leads us to believe in Jesus Christ, who, by his death and resurrection, reveals and communicates to us the Father's intimate mercy. We talk a lot about the message we are supposed to share, and I want to conclude uh, my slides with what the message really is. Chris. Um, touched on it quite a bit in his talk, but I wanna reiterate. What we truly must include in all our catechizing in order to bring people into intimate communion with Christ. So if you see the picture here, we all should know this man, hopefully. Uh, this is Vince Lombardi. He was raised by devout Catholic parents and had in, he had intended to be a priest, but instead went on to play football at Fordham, which as a Packer fan, thank goodness, but in 1961, following a losing season, he realized that his team needed to put fundamentals first. 
Each year at the beginning of training camp, he would hold up a football and tell the team, gentlemen, this is a football. Lombardi knew that the will to win was not enough. To perform at their best, his players needed to know that they had prepared as thoroughly as possible to win. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesus Christ. Christianity is not Christianity without Christ. Christ must always be present in everything we say and do and expect. Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium reminds us on the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must reign out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. This is the kerygma that Christopher mentioned. This is the first proclamation. One, God loves me unconditionally and has created me for relationship with him. I have broken my relationship with God by sin. Jesus restores my relationship with God through his life, death, and resurrection. Jesus invites me to trust him to turn from sin and to give him, give my life to him. Jesus has poured the Holy Spirit into my heart to bring me to new life in his church. The kerygma, the kerygma must always be proclaimed in every aspect of catechesis. There is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth the Son of God are not proclaimed. What does it mean to keep the gospel message at the forefront of catechesis? First, it means that the catechist, you, teacher, catechist, must become more familiar with the gospel message by reading and praying with the gospel. Second, it means attempting to make mental, spiritual, imaginative, not pretend or false connections between the gospel and your own life experiences or those experiences of those you are teaching. So if nothing else, in catechizing and teaching, proclaim the gospel. Help those you catechize understand how the gospel is relevant to their daily life. Be an example of faith to those you teach. coming back together we had a comment um in Curcio. we ask ourselves what did i do to bring about change in others and or the world for the better and that's evangelization to me and that's very that's that's right it's like how can what we know of our faith and what we teach and the love of christ how can we know that that is the betterment for life what is it that we do that helps better others? Um, and, and I mean, in our world today, there is so much conflict, but what is the best that we can do to share God's word, to make every other's lives better or make the world around us a better place? Are there any other comments or questions from my presentation? All right, well, we'll close in prayer. I thank you again for um, spending your, your evening with us. Um, I hope that what you heard from Christopher and I are helpful, uh, is helpful for you, that it, if nothing else, it gives you a chance to just stop and think, you know, what is my calling? What am I called to do? What has God asked of me um, as a missionary disciple of him? Um, and am I doing what he, his will is? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to be the teacher through me, is it God's will that I am uh, following through with, or or am I trying to instill my own? And it should be it should be God's will. So let us close with a a glory be, and I wish all of you a safe and happy evening, and a wonderful day tomorrow. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is it now was in the beginning, it is in the beginning, it is in the Amen. Amen. Okay. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening.